Welcome back to part three of our series where we are finally building our trading strategy for our Python trading robot. Alrighty, so previous video, we cloned the repo. We walked through some of the folders and files and try to give you an overview about which ones are important, which ones aren't important. We also spent a pretty significant amount of time on the config file, and then we started writing the code to actually read that config file, doing things also like importing our libraries and initializing our Pi robot object. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna define what symbol we wanna trade. And then from here, we're gonna define a, kind of basically like a position, uh, then also grabbing some historical pricing and then also walking through some of the indicators. We're also gonna spend some time just on challenges that might come across when we're importing uh, data. So there might be some symbols you might not be able to trade just simply because of the fact of you don't have the data to enough of the data to calculate the indicators, at least from TD Ameritrade. So we will get started. All right. So next slide. What are we going to do? Well, we got to create a portfolio. This is just one of those uh, objects that we need to have in the background. So that way, as we add a position or something like that, it's just already there waiting for us to go. Uh, it's actually super easy. I don't make it super intensive, uh, but we can also do things down the road, like actually grab all of our positions and stuff like that. But regardless, you just need to do a create portfolio, uh, something just like that. I try to have usage example in here as well. So that way it's not super confusing. We're gonna also define our trading symbol. So I'm actually gonna buy uh, a, a stock called Fuel Cell. It's really funny, actually. <laughs> I have a funny story about this one. This thing, I swear to God, I've been following it since like 2011, and it's an interesting stock, to say the least. I'll just put it like that. Uh, I have just been surprised where it's like it's like at eight dollars a share or something like that now. Um, yeah, there there was a time <laughs> there was a time that it was definitely a lot more than that, as you can tell. But uh, yeah, it's that's actually kind of odd. Maybe they did a reverse split or something like that. I swear to God, it used to be lower than this, but they probably did a reverse split or something like that. Regardless. It's a very active stock right now. I mean, especially when I go on Robinhood, it's been doing some crazy moves left and right. You can see like in the last month, it went from like $2.69 a share to almost $8. So you can see that's pretty dramatic. That's also a little bit of a concern because a lot of times if there's that much hype around it, that could be an indication of something else. But in this situation, I'm not planning to take very large position, like we're literally just gonna buy one share. <laughs> so at this point, it's more just for demonstration purposes. Uh, I also will switch out with another symbol, ADT, just to show some challenges when it comes to getting price data. I don't know if ADT was the exact one, but there's a couple where it's like, you have to really keep in mind that you're not gonna always be able to get the historical data you want. So from here, let's add a single position that's gonna represent the fuel cell position. Uh, with this one, it's gonna be trading robot portfolio, and then it's gonna be add position. Uh, with this one, we need to provide a symbol. We have that trading symbol, not trading robot, trading symbol. Then we also need to specify the asset type. In this case, it's gonna be an equity. So it's gonna be a, basically a stock. Um, there's other things in here, even though I provide the options, it doesn't necessarily mean you can trade it. So things like futures, for example, you can't trade using the TD Ameritrade API, interact brokers you can, and I believe, well, TradeStation, I know, I believe interactive brokers you can as well. But just keep in mind, just because I provide it doesn't necessarily mean you can trade it. Sometimes we like to keep it uh, because we want to know other positions and stuff like that. So it kind of has to be flexible. Okay, so let's now define and grab the historical price. Uh, grab the historical prices. In this situation, we need to first define the start date and the end date. Data, not data, date. So we're going to define our start date. It's going to equal date time. We'll start starting from today. You don't have to start from today, but you can. 
And then we're going to also do the end date. And so whenever you're working with dates, uh, take your date time object and then call your time delta. And then your time delta basically allows you to specify how far to look back and stuff like this. So in this situation, we can do days and you can say 30 days. We'll look 30 days back. Also keep in mind with historical prices, you can only go back so far. I believe it's 90 days. I think if I remember correctly, at least for no 30 days for, I think for minute level data, if I remember correctly, or maybe like 30, it's like a really odd number. So let's grab the historical prices. And so here, uh, what we'll do is we'll say historical prices. So what we're going to do is we're going to do trading robot, grab historical prices. The start will be the start date. The end will be the end date. Then we need to specify our bar size. So this is basically the size of our bar and it kind of depends on, I guess like that's the frequency aspect of it. So bar size is that, and then we have bar type. So this is basically saying like, there's different types of bar. There's minute bars, there's monthly bars, there's daily bars. So this specifies that type of bar. And then the bar size specifies the frequency. So one minute bar, two minute bar, three minute bar. So that's kind of how you need to think about this one. Now from here, uh, we'll just print out the historical prices. I think it comes back as a dictionary. Let me check. We'll see in a second. Bad request. Why is it a bad request? Start. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to switch these up. I know what it is. Oh, I forgot to do that last time. OK, so that's a key error. I think it's candles. OK, let's do it the old fashioned way. So it's working. I always get mixed up, mixed up with the start date and the end date because the start date is basically like looking back. This is where you're starting. And then your end date is when you're ending the look back, basically. So you can see it's pulling everything in here and it's basically just a bunch of candles. It is formatted in a different way. Uh, this is not technically how TD Ameritrade sends it back to you. The reason I send it like this is because we're going to see next in order to create a data frame from it. It's a little bit easier if we have everything set up. So that's just one of those like, it's nice to have. You don't have to do it now. I've done it for you. So it makes it a little bit easier to work with. From here, we're going to convert the data to a stock frame. Ah. And then from here, we're going to do stock frame equals. And then it's going to be trading robot, trading robot, create stock frame. And then we just need to provide the data. In this case, we're going to do historical prices. And then there's going to be a key called aggregated. So that's basically the aggregated data that you're seeing right here. This includes things like the symbol inside of it, uh, the date time and stuff like that. So we just want to make sure we pass through the aggregated one. Um, maybe at some point I might just make it where you can just pass through historical prices and then I'll check for you. But right now you have to specify that. And then from here, <clears throat> um, you can also print the stock frame, and then I there's a frame property, and then with that one, you can do the head. So the stock frame, you can always access the, the actual data frame itself by going to the frame property, and then it's going to work just like you would any, any other normal data frame. So if you ever want to access just the normal data frame, you can just go to the frame property. The reason I have the whole stock frame is because when it comes to multiple indexes and stuff like that, it's just a little bit easier if I know the structure beforehand. Okay, so from here, we can also do things like we can add our stock frame to the portfolio. Um, we can also do the same with historical prices and stuff like that. Um, so <clears throat> this is just more for demonstration purposes. So let's <clears throat> add the stock frame to the uh, portfolio. So we can do something like this trading robot. And then we can do the portfolio and then historical prices equals the stock frame. <laughs> and then 
Oh, sorry, not that one. We want to do the historical prices. Oh wait, no, I'm doing I'm doing it wrong. I need to do the stock frame object. Sorry about that. Okay, so you can do that. You can also do trading robot portfolio and then historical prices as well. So you could also pass this through as well. Again, it's just making it where the objects, you can hand them off to different objects. And then if you potentially wanted to leverage them in those as well, it's already kind of set up where that mechanism for transferring it, it's, it's right there. So then it just makes it a little bit easier to work with it. Kind of like a component object model, if you wanted to think of it like that. So that's just adding it. And then from here, let's move into indicators. So uh, remember that our strategy is we want a 200 day moving average and then a 50 day moving average as well. So we're going to create a new <coughs> indicator object. So we're going to do indicator client equals indicators. And then this one, we need the price data frame, which is really just your stock frame that we already defined. So that's that. Then from here, we need to start defining the indicators we want to use. So on this one, add the, the 200 day SMA. Uh, keep in mind, I don't have every, <laughs> every single indicator in there, but I have some popular ones. So SMA, so in this situation, we're gonna give a period, the period represents 200, and then we can give it a column name. So if you don't provide it, there is a default one, but if you plan to have multiple of the same indicators, for example, so if we're gonna have multiple SMAs in here, so just different period calculations, then I would recommend that you pass through the column name. In fact, it's not recommended, you have to do it because if you wanted to start doing comparisons, you're gonna overwrite the other one in case you don't. So in that situation, think of this as required uh, unless you only plan to just use one of those indicators. So here, add the 50 day, 50 day SMA. So we're do indicator client SMA. And then in this case, period will be 50. And then in this situation, I want my column name to be SMA 50. So we'll do that. Uh, I'll just show you another, you know, there's other indicators in here. We're not going to necessarily leverage this one, but I'll show you how to add another indicator. So we'll do the 50 day EMA indicator clients, EMA period equals 50. Uh, there's an alpha in there. It defaults to zero if you want it to. And then column name in this situation, like, okay, we will do the uh, EMA, just that one. So uh, we don't, because we don't have multiple, we can just leave the default. And so let's see what that looks like. We'll, we'll kind of do what we did up here. We'll do print, stock frame, frame, and then head. Hopefully no problems, right? <laughs> Great. So right now, because I'm starting at the top, we don't have 50 values, but if I change this to tail, we should see them. <clears throat> and then before I move on to the next part, I do want to talk a little bit more about the data. So now you can see they were calculating just like we wanted to. I chose a very specific one. So this one had a consistent minute level data, right? So 31, 30, 29, 28, 27. Some stocks aren't like this. Some will go 27, 35, 37, 40. In those situations, you don't have much of an option. You have to go to some other data source um, unless you've been collecting the data long enough time and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, in some cases, grabbing historical prices for certain stocks, TD Ameritrade will not actually give you every single bar for like minute level data. So in that situation, you would have to explore other data sets unless you're calculating your indicator in some fashion where I guess you wouldn't need every minute. I, I don't know. It really depends on your situation, unfortunately. But I would say if you're trying to do it in the more traditional sense where you have enough minute level data to calculate each of the indicators, you might have to be selective on your, your trading symbols. Um, other option, like I said, is you, you would technically have to grab some other data source. The nice thing about this is as long as you give me some type of format like this with an, the, an extra column for a symbol and then a date timestamp, that's really all I need. So we can always create a, a stock frame from you. It doesn't technically have to come from 
TD Ameritrade. I just need to make you just need to make sure that it's basically formatted in a certain way so I can create the stock frame for you. So that's just some things to keep in mind. But you can see it's basically calculating everything we wanted it to. So that's super nice. It makes our lives 10 times easier. Um, now comes the part where it's a little bit more tricky. So I'll, I'll kind of just do this one final thing and then I'll cut it off. And then in our next video, we'll shift gears to actually defining our trade object. But from here, we're going to uh, basically add a signal check. So this is what we're checking. This is what we're looking for. So we're going to say indicator client set indicator signal compare. So there's two options. You have indicator signal or you have indicator signal compare. You would use compare if you're planning to compare two different indicators, for example, right? So let's imagine for a second, we're comparing the SMA 50 to the SMA 200. In that situation, because they're both considered indicators, you would use indicator compare. However, if you were saying, looking at just like the SMA 200 and you're just seeing if that indicator goes above or below a certain value, then you could do indicator signal. So in that situation, you don't need to worry about it. However, on a compare, you do only because you need to specify how you're comparing them because otherwise we're not checking for a value in that situation. So we're gonna do indicator signal compare. Indicator one in this situation is SMA 50. So this is the one that we're gonna start out with. Indicator two equals SMA 200. And then we have the condition buy. So in what situation would we buy? So what is considered a buy signal? In this situation, we're gonna take the operator module and then we're gonna say greater than or equal. So we're gonna use this function. So if this one is greater or equal to this one, that's considered a buy. The next one is condition sell. This is the operator and this one's gonna be less than or equal. So if this one's less than this one, that's considered a sell. So order matters here. This is what you're starting out with. This is what, so this is basically what you're comparing to. Here's my indicator that I'm comparing to. Here's the other indicator I'm going to use to compare. So if this one is greater than this one, then it's a buy. If this one is less than this one, it's a sell. So just be aware of that. Order matters very much when you're defining your compares. Otherwise, potentially you could have an issue. So. At this point, I am going to cut off the video. If you do have any final questions, feel free to put them down in the comments below. Uh, also, if you're new to the channel, please do consider subscribing. Uh, you know, And if you have recommendations for new content, I'm always open to hearing it. In our next video, we're gonna continue on. We're gonna build our actual order that we're gonna use to trade. And then from there, I think, yeah, we'll have a little bit more only because we still have to define the main loop. Depending on how long it takes, I might have to finish this series on Monday or Tuesday when the market's open. So I might post a few videos this weekend just to have it out there and get people ready for it. But I don't plan to actually finish this series probably until Monday. I, I might do more tomorrow just to show you how to set it up. But the actual kind of running loop, I don't I think we're gonna have to wait till Monday. So uh, thank you again for watching, everybody. We'll see you in video number four.